Mendelssohn made perhaps his most significant contribution to that German history in his five symphonies. The third of these was finished in 1842, but its roots lie in that famous trip to Scotland a dozen years earlier. Mendelssohn wrote that he first conceived his Scottish symphony during his visit to the ruins of Holyrood Abbey in Edinburgh. How does Mendelssohn summon up the brooding majesty of the scene? Something he's brilliant at is painting with the orchestra. And so just listen to the quality of the sound at the opening. A plangent and full-throated woodwind chorus, rich but without significant bass. Normally you might expect a velvety underlay of cellos and double basses, but there are none. The harmony rides on a much slenderer platform of horns and bassoons. I think Mendelssohn is looking at the sheer vastness of the sky, an endless horizon, brooding and stark. Writing a symphony after Beethoven is a huge act for a composer. The Scottish Symphony is without doubt one of the best examples of Mendelssohn expanding the idea of German music, paradoxically as it sounds, through images of another country. One of the important things about the idea of German music is that it's meant to appeal to the whole of humanity. This is music that's going to give all people, not just German people, a kind of moral standard. In 1842, none other than Queen Victoria accepted the dedication of the Scottish Symphony. How interesting that just three months later she made her first trip north of the border to the country that had become one of the most potent and romantic locations in Europe. O oh, Caledonia, stern and wild, meet nurse for a poetic child, Land of brown heath and shaggy wood, land of the mountain and the flood, land of my sires. What mortal hand can e'er untie the filial band that knits me to thy rugged strand? Three literary giants had dominated the young Mendelssohn's world. Shakespeare, who he'd set, Goethe, who he'd met, and the wizard of the north, Sir Walter Scott. The day after visiting Holyrood Abbey, Mendelssohn travelled out to the writer's legendary boarder's home, Abbotsford. This is the main library. There's the study next door, of course, but as you can see, 10,000 books round about you here and artefacts of all kinds and the bust by Chantry at the other end there. Can you describe for us Mendelssohn's meeting with Scott? Mendelssohn's meeting with Scott's a very mysterious thing really because on the suggestion of various people like his mother and given the spirit of the age he felt it was mandatory to see one of the great lions of Europe. Looking into what actually happened it does appear to be something of a disappointment because Scott, 1829, Scott is tired, he's in debt, huge debt, he's only three years away from dying and Abbotsford is being held almost in trust it's become a kind of tourist trap too. So in fact, 
Mendelssohn comes armed with his letter of introduction, but in fact, Scott really doesn't pick up on him at all. And Mendelssohn says rather wryly afterwards, I've had it with great men, he says. <laughs> Despite this, Scott's writing had a huge impact on Mendelssohn's thinking. The matrix of things that Scott gives is almost limitless. New way of looking at history, new way of looking at nature and landscape. All these things, plus settings of gothic attraction and the marvellous, that complex of things that just caught the mood of the incipient century and launched it so that everybody in Europe, from, from Victor Hugo down to Turgenev to Tolstoy, they all say we are the children of Walter Scott. For Mendelssohn, Scotland was to remain a rich well of inspiration providing a pictorial and poetic base to his musical romanticism, just as it had for the poet Keats, who'd made a similar trip a few years earlier. The keats Mendelssohn comparison is rather interesting. Keats wanted a, a local homegrown version of the sublime, really. I mean, that's what it comes to. That's why he goes to Fingal's Cave, and of course I'm thinking particularly of, of Fingal's Cave because of, uh, because of Mendelssohn. And the idea was to address himself to the sort of mightiest things that he could find and to use that as a way of thinking about how to crank up the imaginative scale of things and at the same time to give some physical reality to what drove him in almost all walks of his imaginative life, which was to think about how writers might do good in the world. Mendelssohn's vision was almost identical and perhaps nowhere more so than at the transformative, hymn-like conclusion to his Scottish symphony. It wasn't only his large-scale visions that touched a nerve with the British. Mendelssohn's more modest music was taking a special place in Victorian domestic life. The piano industry was booming in Britain. By 1842, the famous piano maker Broadwood was one of the 12 largest employers in London. Instruments were finding their way into the homes, not just of the wealthy, but of the burgeoning middle class. And all these people needed music to play. In his incredibly popular series of short pieces that he termed Songs Without Words, Mendelssohn provided music to let the Victorian's imagination run free. when he did write music for a particular story, the results were more than evocative. One of my most treasured possessions is this engraving of a painting by Richard Dadd. And uh, it's called Puck and the Fairies. It's a scene from A Midsummer Night's Dream. Puck is, relatively speaking, huge. The spirits, the fairies running around underneath him, are tiny, feminine maybe, androgynous almost certainly. I think Mendelssohn played a huge part in how the Victorians imagined the supernatural world. In 1843, he wrote more music for A Midsummer Night's Dream, and here, with his magical moods and evocative dreamscapes, he conjures up a brand new vision of a mercurial, quicksilver fairyland. This is quintessential fairy music. You hear the sparkle of fairy dust and see the gossamer wings. But Mendelssohn's magic is always hard won. 
and in recording it, the orchestra and I came face to face with its fiendish difficulty. Thank you very much indeed. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Yeah, I find you getting slightly behind at the, at the top of that run, and then clarinets, bassoon, so you're behind. Tend to the strings and the wind start to part company, so just keep absolutely tight. Yup, pop, pop, beep, pop, pop, beep, pop. It is caring, and I tell you this because uh, we finished playing two days ago the Midsummer Night Dream stage music. How could have a so-called modern orchestra of the time of Mendelssohn have played this infernal scherzo, mm. the way it's written. I mean, today clarinets, bassoons, oboes are much improved instrument and still is hell, mm. I guarantee you. For this orchestra which knows even the, the shadow behind the notes of Mendelssohn is hell for them. because the modernity in the instrumental way was so much ahead of his time, and I don't think he was a man easy for slow tempi. And in a way, perhaps that's part of his genius, that he deliberately made it feel on the edge of possibility, and I, and I know from my own experience that something as basic as choice of speed, of tempo, that there's a certain speed that will work very well, say for the clarinets, but it won't suit the violins and so on, you exactly. know, to find that mean, but it's always going to be on the edge. Very tricky, I tell you. Getting everyone to commit to the optimum tempo is key here. It's not easy, but we're there now. As a conductor, Mendelssohn was renowned for raising the standards of playing in his orchestras. And in Britain, he captured the public imagination with his pioneering use of that new conductor's tool, the baton. Sadly, no images of Mendelssohn conducting exist, but the Bodleian Library can go one better. Yes, we're fortunate that two of the batons owned by Mendelssohn have survived um, and are in this collection. Uh, there's this one, which, as you can see, is an elaborate affair. It looks like a conjurer's wand, doesn't with it? with ivory. Yes, but alongside that, we've got this white stick, um, which is decidedly more utilitarian object. Um, it's a whalebone covered with white leather. Um, this feels very heavy. It's like batons, as I say, today are these very, very light things, and they are essentially extensions of the arm. Oh, yes. Whereas this feels, you know, I mean, if I gave an upbeat with that, the orchestra would go, bang! <laughs> Mendelssohn became Britain's favourite and most respected maestro. And a fascinating connection began to spark in the Victorian imagination. The baton conductor was quite interesting because when he, and it was a he at the time, would spring upon the platform um, and magically control an entire group of people by just waving his arms about, the audiences and the press responded with terms such as wizard. This was tied in with mesmerism in quite an interesting way because the conductor began to wear the black tie outfit that we associate with conductors today and mesmerists took the same costume. And so there was this mix-up going on in the public imagination. This actually was a connection that continued right to the end of the century. So even in the novel Dracula, for instance, we get Dracula raising his arms like a conductor, and the wolves respond to him. So there's this sense of magic and an almost occult sense, you know, raising the dead, raising the spirits. Victorian Britain was well aware of its dark side, of the social and moral consequences of poverty in its great and crowded cities. Just like today, people were desperate for a magic solution to the problems of a modern world. And in the 19th century, Mendelssohn and his music would become a powerful force in this struggle for reform. Across the country, choral societies were bringing huge numbers of our urban populations together. 
This great British tradition, which survives to this day, provided the seedbed for Mendelssohn's last masterpiece. Mendelssohn's most enduring legacy, I think, to Victorian Britain was his oratorio, Elijah, a piece which tells in music the story of that grand Old Testament prophet. And it took a place very quickly in the British people's hearts alongside that of Messiah. It was commissioned once again by the Birmingham Triennial Festival and had its first performance here at the Town Hall with Mendelssohn himself conducting. It's rather surprising that Mendelssohn, who was a very sort of conservative uh, musician, should have been drawn to this fiercest of Old Testament prophets. But I think the point is Mendelssohn felt that the world was falling into a state of moral decay and the world needed someone like an Elijah to, tell them, to make them sit up and realize the error of their ways. In the magnificently restored building that Mendelssohn knew so well, we performed some of the most dramatic sections of Elijah, especially for this program. Working with members of six amateur choirs from right across the West Midlands. So let me just give you a little bit of background. This is a piece which tells the story of that great vengeful and at times furious prophet, Elijah, who has a prolonged attempt effectively to save the souls of his people. So we're going to be exploring a section today which is all about false gods. You, the populace, crying for your false god. And then Elijah trying to drag you back from the abyss. One, two, three, one, two, three, and here I go. This is not, repeat, not polite music. This is not something which is prayerful. What we need is a sound approaching that of the football terrace, really, for this section. Okay? And the other most important thing to say to you right now, ladies and gentlemen, so hopefully we can eradicate it right now, is that you are wonderfully, fabulously, and gloriously behind the whole time. Okay? Mendelssohn, I think, saw himself a little bit as an Elijah himself in a musical way, in the sense that he saw himself to be the guardian of true musical values. Well, speak it to me. One, two, three, one, two, three. Here comes God. Good. Now shout it at me, please. One, two, three, two, two, three. Here comes God. That's the effect I want. Now shot me. And Here comes God. Oh, 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 oh. Go. Oh. There was great fear of groups of people coming together. Because on the one hand, you had revolutionary mob activity in France um, at this time, and that was rather close, <laughs> you know, 30 miles across the English Channel. But there was also a sense that if you could get a group of people working together in the right sort of way, the nation could advance. And so it touched on that great Victorian word, progress. Ah! This man, Elijah, he's not a remote mystical figure uh, delivering platitudes for, from on high. He's a, he's a character that people can associate with. And Mendelssohn himself had now become something of an adopted national hero to the British. The premiere of Elijah in Birmingham was a huge national occasion, perhaps the most iconic event in our Victorian musical history. And today, performing this music in the town hall with the BBC Concert Orchestra is still a viscerally thrilling experience. Mendelssohn's forces for the premiere numbered over 400 and somehow another two and a half thousand souls had managed to squeeze in to hear them. The 
great thing about Elijah is that he's got a wonderful line in sarcasm. And this is always very refreshing, I think, with an Old Testament prophet. I love it particularly um, when he's challenging the worshippers of the false god Baal to prove that their god exists. He says, come on, call, call him, call him. And there's no answer. He says, call him again. When the piece was first performed, of course, this character with his back to basics, no frills attached sort of religion would have resonated very well with nonconformist attitude, which was very prevalent, especially in the Midlands. Massive choirs had a sound that would reach for miles, but for someone to sing in it, there was actually a physically represented in front of them and, and orally heard a, a sense of national unity. The task of creating this score was immense. Like Elijah, Mendelssohn had taken himself to the brink. When he's almost at his wit's end, there we see the private man inside. There's, there's no one around to hear him when he turns to God and says, look, this is enough. I've done as much as I can. I've tried to persuade them to come back to you. They've killed all the other prophets, all your prophets they have killed. I'm the only one left. I don't think I can go on much more. Oh. 
Exhausted, Mendelssohn suffered a series of strokes, and just a year after the premiere of Elijah, on the 4th of November 1847, he died at his home in Leipzig. He was just 38. The death of Felix Mendelssohn marks the end of my journey through two centuries of musical and cultural change in Great Britain. His extraordinary impact here helped create a lasting vision of our national musical culture. The still familiar world of conductors and concert halls, of choral societies and piano practice, of fantasy and imagination, of ceremony and celebration. <laughs> Over 200 years, as Britain's political and social landscape was transformed, four towering composers played their part in providing a soundtrack for our nation. From Purcell, Handel, Haydn and Mendelssohn, we have inherited great music for the grandest and most solemn state occasions. Music that inspires, just lets us have fun. The pleasures of friendship, freedom and wine. The pleasures of friendship, freedom and wine. But their music does more than just entertain us. It brings our communities together. I discovered as I traveled the country in the making of these films, it celebrates our landscape, our lives, and our language. And with Elijah, the creation, and Messiah, these composers bequeathed us a national soundtrack in a uniquely British form. During this journey, we've witnessed how music has always been at the heart of the transformation of British society, and above all, we've celebrated the richness of British culture which comes from looking beyond our borders. British music is and has always been a platform for music and ideas of every sort. Our diversity is our strength.